Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today I'm having another nerdy Unity catalog day looking at a thing called Volume. The volumes came in, they were announced at the Data AI Summit, and they're essentially a way of taking some external storage location full of files and associating it with Unity Catalog with an alias. Yes, if you're thinking that sounds exactly like mount points always did in the workspace, that is correct. They are very similar to mount points, except they're managed and governed through Unity Catalog. They're part of the new governance layer and all the extra functionality and lineage detection and all of that good stuff that you get if you're using Unity Cat. Now that's great because that was a missing piece of the puzzle. So our traditional architecture has always been have some kind of cloud storage blob that files and folders are landing into as we get sent data from various different sources. Like maybe a vendor is sending us a daily update file. Maybe we're streaming files into somewhere else. But we need to put that somewhere. And before we put that into a Delta table, we need somewhere to be able to just land it and then see if it'll fit into our Delta table so we can manage things like scheme revolution and rescue columns and all that good stuff. Now, previously that had been missing from Unity Catalog. So the way we used to do things with mount points, being able to just point to an alias and really easily just manage who can access that uh, given location, we suddenly couldn't do through Unity Catalog and we'd have to go, well, I'm just going to connect through codes to that blob store to get some files in and then our governance story starts. And that was no good. And that is exactly what volumes are trying to do. They're saying, let's fix that. Let's put in a place for files and folders to live that aren't necessarily a clean table of data. That's the start of our lake house journey. So we're going to have a look at what they are, how they work, and how we set them up. That is the plan. As always, if you are new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. And yeah, let's just go have a look. So there's a big announcement. We, we heard them all as part of all the announcements uh, going on at the Data AI Summit. There's lots of things that people were saying, hold on, we actually do need mount points. Not, not everything is a table. So good. They listened. That's always nice. Uh, and there's a whole load of information about how you use them, where they live, all of that stuff. We're going to step through this, but I'll put a link to this blog down in the comments below so you can go and have a look at how that works. Main thing, you can use it across all of these things. The file system, DV utils, you can use it in Spark, you can use it in SQL, you can use it in Pandas. The same as mount points always were, except now it's inside Unity Catalog. So, great. Great news for us. So where are they? How do they, how do they, how do they work? Where do they live? So... I'm in my Dataworks uh, workspace. I'm in the workspace that I only hooked up to Unity Catalog, I think, in last week when I made a video. So we can go and have a look at what we've got. So first things first, we need to have an external storage location set up. So if I just bring this up a little bit, you should be able to see down at the bottom. There we go. So I do have external data set up. And I've got a storage credential, my managed identity, and I've got an external location. So before I could do anything, I needed to do this. I need to say, well, I want to create a location. Let's give me the name of my location, whatever it happens to be, the full lake path of it. Now, I originally tried to set this with blob storage. It didn't work with blob storage. It's expecting it to be an ABFSS path in Azure. That is an Azure Data Lake Storage N2, aka blob with hierarchical namespace enabled. So it's currently looking for an actual lake. That's the volume you're, you're adding in. So you put your location in, including the container, including any um, suffix path you want, and then you need to pick the credential to associate. That's the first thing we need to do. It needs to be set up before we can do anything else. When we've done that, we can then go and create our volume. Now, volumes are created kind of like a table. They live in the same place that a table would in the hierarchy. So I need to go up to my data. I need to pick a catalog. Again, you can see one of my catalogs I can't use because I've locked it down to the workspaces. I'm going to go to my dev catalog. I've got this sources schema. So I made a schema where I can keep my volumes. And then I've got a volume sat in there. So you can see that looks different to all the tables. It is a volume that has been created. So to do that, inside sources, I have to go and create something. I'm going to create a volume here. What's my volume going to be? This is going to be my landing area. Do I want it to be managed? AKA, I'm just going to make part of the managed lake. So the lake inside of the meta store, I can expose part of it, a subpath, as a as a volume. Or do I want it as an external volume? I'm going to take a lake of my own somewhere and say, hey, I want to register this. I want this available under an alias for people to go and query. So in this case, I've got my external location. I've got my area of it. I can go and create this as another volume. 
This might not let me because I've already got this place uh, logged as a volume. Yeah, it already exists. Don't worry, there's already another one. But essentially, you follow those through, you create that, and that's where I land ended up with this landing created. So I just simply said, go to volume, or create a volume, pick an existing external data source, give it a name, and I called it landing. Now you can see I've got that three-part naming. So dev, bronze, sources, landing, that is how I'm gonna to refer to this whole folder structure. So in the same way, back in the workspaces times, I'd have said, well, slash mount, slash whatever name I gave, slash mount, slash landing in this example. Now I've got that three-part naming, but that also means it comes under the security of whoever can access the catalog and the schema. So I've got a good way of securing who can access the mount point, which oh was a missing thing for so long in how we manage uh, mount points and workspaces. So great. It's really, really, really good. Yes, you now have to type another part whenever you refer to your volume, but that's not the end of the world. Way better than having to do the full path, ABFS, SS, slash, slash, etc. Way better than having an arbitrary mount point that literally everybody can access. This makes sense. So cool. Happy. Um, again, you can go and have a look at permissions. You can see how it's been set up. You can see the volume. You can set permissions as to who's allowed to ac uh, access that object. Or you can have that as part of who's allowed to access the schema it lives inside. So it all sounds good. And I've got a browser. I can go and have a look the same way we had that DBFSS browser. Where we can go and have a look what's in the mount points. Again, we can go and see everything that's in here. We can go and browse around the volume that we've added. Which is pretty cool. I could also upload it. And there's some things talking about this is a great way to allow users to, to upload their own data. Maybe. Maybe. Mostly, I see this as part of the engineering workflow. This is how files start their journey before they're cleansed and standardized and homogenized into our lake house path. So let's say that maybe I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm like, well, I want to I want to go and work with this. I'm going to copy that path while I'm here. How do we go and work with this? Well, essentially, that's what we need. This this location. So slash volumes, slash dev, sources, landing. That's exactly how we're going to refer to the files that are in this location. So let's dive over. I've done a quick tester. I can dive in here. Let's grab this and go and have a look. And then exactly as you'd expect to use with a mount point, I can do dbutils.fs.ls volumes, dev, bronze, sources, landing. So that's the exact thing that we had that was listed out in, um, in Data Explorer. Essentially, whatever catalog you put it into, whatever scheme you put it into, whatever you call your volume, that's how you refer to it. And we can see it's, it can see that there is a folder in there. There's a folder called NYC Taxi, and I can go and same way we always could dig down using dbutils.fs.ls to list the structure inside that uh, folder system. And then there we go. Done. Easy. So next test, can I read the data? You can see that I can down there. Now, my files are a bit rubbish. They don't have headers, but, you know, it's fine. It works. So spark.read. Go in further schema, it's a format of a CSV, just load from this location. Slash volume, slash dev, slash sources, slash landing, go into that subfolder and exactly the same as if it was mounted. I no longer need to have the full path, which makes me so happy. It's using the credential that we told it to. So important to know that, that when we refer to our external source, let's dive over here. When I had my external data source, my location when I created it, that already has a credential that's associated with it, which is the storage credential I've used, which is a managed identity. So however you've set up your external location, that's how the volume is going to be connecting to it. So obviously make sure that is all set up right in the first place before you get into here. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad time. Cool. And then the big question for me was, well, we always use auto loader for the file loading. We want to do spark.readstream, format of cloud files, I wanted to do in schema inference. I wanted to be doing schema management. I wanted to have a rescue column so I can put things in if that doesn't work. Is that going to work in this scenario? And yeah, the answer is yes, it does. Again, so it's using the same thing to go and read it. So this is uh, not using notification mode at the moment, but I just need to add in the same things because that's external to how it's doing the data access anyway. Um, so yeah, there you go. It's kicked off a query. You can see it's starting to see some stuff. I can see raw data coming through. It's starting to process data. It's already processed the first batch, and I can see the results from there. Again, it's in further scheme. It's found some rescue data. Interesting. 
uh, because he's got a load of stuff in there. It started streaming at three. Now, obviously, I need to do some schema work and get that working a little bit better. But yeah, it's perfectly happily running an autoloader job over a volume that I've added with a nice easy alias. Now, I don't expect to be using this a huge amount for user data. Sure, you've got some data scientists and you want to give them an easy way to load data and have it put in a managed area of your lake without necessarily giving them carte blanche access to do whatever they want inside that lake. That's a great way to do it. Um, so I kind of expect we'll be seeing it for like sandbox experimentation on the data analyst side, on the data scientist side, uh, as well as this kind of landing area going into my lake, uh, starting things off. So yeah, really easy. Just, just makes sense. Now it's having a play. So this is just turned on. I didn't have to do anything to turn it on. So I just actually saw it by accident. I was going around and I was like, oh, what's that create button? Create volumes. Oh, we've got volumes now. Great. Um, that's basically it. That, that is all you need to know. You now have the ability to create volumes. Go and use it. Try it out uh, in terms of how you're managing any files, whether they're coming into your lake or whether you're just adding and augmenting it and just using it to join some data to your lake. If you've got some reference data, again, it's a way you can be using reference data if you give business users the way to put data there. It doesn't have many controls around it. Not the best way of doing reference data, but it's an easy way of doing reference data. Yeah, just lots of things that we can do. And it's part of the whole UD catalog end-to-end -end process. Done. So go try it out. See how it works. See, put it to its paces. Do realize that it is still in preview. So if you do come across any, this doesn't work for that file type, this doesn't work for that credential, let Databricks know. Um, but yeah, hoping we'll see it go GA soon. And we're certainly going to be looking at using it as our default way of starting off our lake house journey of getting files in. So yeah, that's all for me. So as always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you at the next one. Cheers.